good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session <clears throat> today we are little late uh, being a new year day in telugu calendar as indians we have a tradition to start little late especially on new year days so i wish happy ugadi for uh, all the students who are both online and uh, in the classrooms last year was a tough time because we were not sure need pg or ap pg or a state pg there had been a huge cloud of confusion but i hope that all confusion will clear by the end of this month and we are quite sure whichever it is there is some other entrance so we invite our online students dr kavita naidu shahila rohit fahima amrita renuka tejus and the students of tirupati guntur karnool kakinada and uh, vizag so on the day one we finished glaucoma which is the major topic today also we have a very very major topic which is called cataract tomorrow we will have uveitis so these are the three major issues after that all the remaining topics we can be able to run like uh, 10 15 minutes we can finish one topic so let us make the start of cataract congenital and acquired are the two broad classes congenital and developmental cataracts typically occur because of a disturbance in the growth of the lens in the intrauterine life do you call it as congenital cataract after the birth also there can be a disturbance then you call developmental cataract and typically in congenital cataract the opacity is limited only to the embryonic or the fetal nucleus you know in a lens you have a nucleus and a cortex then if you take the developmental cataract please let me check whether my voice is clear for everybody equally clear for everybody i hope so let me know whether it is loud and clear that's important <clears throat> developmental cataract develops between infancy to adolescence and you will have the opacities in the deeper parts of the cortex or the capsule and uh, what is speciality of developmental cataract at the time of the development of the cataract which part of the lens is in the development will decide that the cataract is localized to a particular zone it is not throughout the lens that is the speciality of the developmental cataract so it is typically limited and affects only a particular zone which is at that point of development of cataract is uh, under the development that is the speciality of the developmental cataract so that is the reason in developmental cataract for example at second year of life i am developing a developmental cataract all the fibers which formed before second year won't be affected and whatever that form after the second year will also not be affected only those fibers which are affected at the time of happening only get affected hence only a zone is involved that is the speciality of the developmental cataract so you have minute opacities if you examine normal population routinely you will find a lot of developmental small small opacities but they don't affect the visual acuity and uh, you need to give midriasis and use a slit lamp examination in order to detect them now doctor is there any genetic factor for the development of this congenital cataract yes sir about 1/3 of the congenital cataracts have got a hereditary predisposition is what we need to fundamentally remember now what is the difference between congenital and acquired cataract acquired means there's an open opacification and 
the degeneration of already formed fibers. You then call it as acquired cataract is what we need to fundamentally understand. Now the classification of the cataracts is one of the very very common question in the exam. So you have congenital capsular cataracts which include anterior capsular and posterior capsular. You have polar cataracts, anterior polar and posterior polar. You have a nuclear lamellar or the other varieties. Then you have sutural and axial cataracts in that you have depending upon the shape of them. They may look like the petals of the flower, floriform. They may look like corelliform. They may look like spear shaped or they can be anterior axial embryonic type of cataract. These are all examples of sutural and axial cataracts. Then what we have generalized cataracts. In that you have coronary cataract, blue dot cataract, total congenital cataract and a congenital membranous cataract. These are all called generalized cataracts. So doctor, all this terminology we need to understand that there is an anterior capsule, posterior capsule, superior pole, inferior pole. Accordingly what do you have? You have a polar cortical cataract, this one. You have a peripheral cortical cataract which is called coronary cataract. Then you can have separation, lamellae only get affected which is lamellar cataract. Then you can have a nuclear cataract. Then you can have a posterior polar cataract or you can have a posterior cortical cataract. Then you can have, uh, I mean, uh, you, you can have a subcapsular cataract. So this is how they are all geographically distributed across the lens. One two comments about each of these different types of cataracts we need to know which are the frequently asked questions. Let us start with first type. Congenital capsular cataracts. In that you may have one anterior capsular and one posterior capsular. What are the two points which are the frequent MCQs about anterior capsular cataract? It is non-axial, stationary and a visually insignificant cataract will be the anterior capsular cataract. Then posterior capsular cataract. We need to remember because of its association with the past with the persistent hyaloid artery remnants. That is the reason we need to remember posterior capsular cataract, not subcapsular, capsular. Then we have second type of congenital after capsular, we have polar cataracts. You have an anterior polar cataract. You have this say anterior pole front of the eye, posterior pole back of the eye. So you have an anterior polar cataract and it involves the central part of the anterior capsule and the adjoining uh, cortex and uh, what leads to a anterior polar cataract basically. Any delay in the development of the anterior chamber at the time of the development of the eye is responsible for the opacity in the anterior pole. So that is the reason a delayed anterior chamber development is the underlying cause in a good number of cases of the anterior polar cataract. Then it is typically bilateral, stationary, non-progressive in nature and visually insignificant. Then one more hypothesis why anterior polar cataract typically involving the central part of the anterior pole and the adjacent cortex, why does it happen? If there is any corneal perforation, whatever be the cause, what is the common cause of the corneal perforation in the case of uh, a developing uh, infant, ophthalmia near term. Thus reason 
anterior polar contracts have an association with ophthalmia neonatarum is what you need to basically remember then we have reduplicated cataract which is also called double cataract another example of uh, we have uh, just before classified no the polar cataract can be antipolar posterior polar then uh, uh, yeah when then uh, we have what is called reduplicated yeah reduplicated cataract what is reduplicated cataract basically it is one of the morphological subtypes of the anterior polar cataract in this what do you have you have the thickening of the central part of the anterior capsule additionally the lens fibers which are staying just beneath that capsule they will also typically get uh, opaque and ultimately these lens fibers which got opaque will separate from the capsular fibers which got opaque and between the two you have normal non opaque and transparent fibers hence the name which is being given is called reduplicated cataract is a special type of anterior polar cataract is what we have to ultimately remember this is also a very common question and that buried opacity into the cortex of the lens is there now out of the two opacities in the reduplicated cataract that is basically called the imprint and together they constitute what is called as reduplicated cataract now we have a posterior polar cataract if you compare anterior polar versus posterior polar posterior polar is much more common than that of the anterior polar there is a small circumscribed opacity which is there in the posterior polar area as we have seen you have the anterior pole you have the posterior pole there can be a lenticular opacity which can be localized in the posterior pole which is then called posterior polar cataract which is much more common than the anterior polar cataract now doctor why should posterior pole and capsule should get affected because there are some associations with the posterior polar cataract which we need to remember persistent hyaloid artery in the embryonic life can leave some remnants which can lead to the development of the posterior polar cataract posterior lenticonus is another important underlying cause which can lead to development of posterior polar cataract in few people there can be a persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous vitreous in the posterior chamber no so that persistence of the hyperplastic uh, vitreous can lead to posterior polar cataract so these are the three important associations of the posterior polar cataract which you need to fundamentally remember <clears throat> dr naidu is having a difficulty with uh, video not clear just find out whether local problem or for everybody is there any problem now doctor here we have to remember one mcq mittendorf dot is associated with which type of cataract posterior polar cataract and what is that it is a persistent hyaloid artery remnant so you can see here you have a anterior capsule and there can be a anterior subcapsular cataract as what you can see then you have a posterior capsule and there can be a dot which is persistent hyaloid artery remnant which is called mittendorf dot is what you have to basically remember <clears throat> now after the cortical i mean capsular and polar cataracts the next important congenital type is called nuclear cataract 
in this we have cataracta centralis pervirent pervirulente lenta which is also called embryonic nuclear cataract why you want to remember this it is an autosomal dominant genetic trait those people who get uh, embryonic nuclear cataract have an autosomal dominant form of inheritance in a very early stage there is a interruption to the development of the lens which lead to this and typically it involves the embryonic nucleus in the lens the nucleus can form when uh, 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 still when the fetus is in embryonic stage that time interruption lead to embryonic nuclear cataract typically this is bilateral and it leads to a rounded opacity exactly in the center of lens and it has got a powdery appearance hence called pulverulenta and uh, it does not affect the vision good news then you have a total nuclear cataract why will this happen when both embryonic and fetal nucleus if both of them get affected and it leads to dense chalky white central opacity and we are worried about this because it can impair the vision and like any other congenital cataract it is non progressive and usually bilateral then comes lamellar which is also called jonular cataract this is one of the favorite mcqs of the examiner why this is a favorite question because if the examiner ask a question the most common type of the congenital cataract leading to the visual impairment your answer must come reflexly lamellar or, or the same thing is called jonular cataract also and why it is called jonular because it affects a discrete zone of the lens now let us look at few typical clinical scenarios this is an example of a morganian cataract where uh, morganian cataract in hypermature cataract in adults you know but i am talking about congenital cataract may in this the intact nucleus has liquefied and uh, typically has uh, 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 drooped down due to the gravity now this is the most common type of cataract which is called lamellar cataract with small riders which is a very important feature then we were talking about that pul pulverulent cataract no where fetal nucleus is affected this is an example where you have central pulverulent cataract with myriads of tiny dots then as we go ahead we will talk about blue dot cataract this is an example of a cerulean otherwise called blue dot cataract then in few people cataract extends along the sutural uh, along the sutures called sutural cataract one of the types of the developmental cataract this is an exa another example of a y kind of a suture which is developing a y suture type of a cataract this is an example of what we call corally formed cataract then there can be a persistent hyperplastic vitreous which can be associated with the posterior capsular posterior polar cataract we said no so this is the typical appearance of it now doctor coming back to our most common type of cataract which is lamellar or jonular cataract what are the important points that you need to know <clears throat> it is usually autosomal dominant type of inheritance which is associated then vitamin d deficiency and lamellar and jonular cataract need to be remembered sometimes the maternal rubella infection which is occurring between 7th to 8th week of gestation can lead to lamellar cataract which itself is a favorite mcq of the examiner now the most important feature in this is you have a zone of a fetal nucleus surrounding the embryonic nucleus 
which is uh, characteristic of uh, the lamellar, otherwise called jonular cataract. And uh, if you look at this cataract structure, outside and inside that uh, cataractus area, the remaining part of the lens is very clear. And there are a lot of small linear opacities like spokes of the wheel, which are called riders, are seen towards the equator. This is one of the common questions asked. Riders are typically seen in which type of cataract? Your answer is lamellar or jonular cataract. Usually it is bilateral and unfortunately it causes severe visual defects. That's the reason the most common type of the congenital cataract which is known to lead to visual impairment will become lamellar, otherwise called the jonular cataract is what you need to remember. Then we have sutural and axial cataracts. Sutural cataracts are very common and they can involve Y suture as what you have seen in the earlier clinical photograph. But usually they are static, bilateral and do not affect the vision. These are the three important things you need to always uh, remember. Then if you look at these uh, sutural and axial cataracts among the congenital cataracts, they have got different patterns. They can be floriform, coralliform, spear shaped or it can extend along the anterior Y suture any of these forms they can be able to assume. Now comes generalized cataracts. Two, three comments about each of them. In textbook you will have pages and pages together of information. 80% of that information is useless when it comes to entrance exam. One or two fine points will be frequently asked about that special type of cataract, subtype of cataract. Those two, three points you must know. At the same time, you should not uh, become only point specific. That's a whole challenge of uh, preparation for entrance. Your total ophthalmology notes should not exceed 200 pages. That itself is undigestible, non assimilable material. So the textbook will be about some six, seven hundred pages. So you must know how to screen the information and identify what is commonly asked in the exam. So doctor, coronary cataract, this very common type of developmental cataract which occurred at the time of puberty. So you have one fetal nucleus, embryonic nucleus, etc, etc. No? So typically it involves an adolescent nucleus. And it need to be remembered because it lead to hundreds and hundreds of opacities. Small, 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 small dot like opacities. And these opacities will typically will have a radial distribution in the periphery of lens. They are club shaped, coronally located opacities. Hence the name coronary cataract. Since they are affecting the periphery, the vision is usually unaffected in case of coronary cataract. So you have multiple small, small, small opacities in the periphery, dot like opacities. Then what is meant by blue dot cataract? It is also called cataracta punctata cerulea. It typically occurs during the first two decades of life. And in this also, it is uh, usually stationary and it does not affect the vision. Then you have total congenital cataract. Why we need to remember? A total congenital cataract is often a consequence of the maternal rubella. That's the reason we need to remember. Especially when the rubella affects in the first trimester of pregnancy, that leads to total congenital cataract. And when the child is born, he is already born with a dense white nuclear cataract in case of the congenital cataract. 
unlike the other developmental cataracts most of the times they are non progressive and static rubella associated complete congenital total congenital cataract is not static it is a progressive type of cataract ultimately it will soften it will liquefy and it lead to a morganglion which we have seen in the earlier clinical photograph a congenital morganglion cataract it can lead to the rubella associated total congenital cataract that's the reason we need to remember then we have congenital membranous cataract why does this basically happen if there is any absorption of a congenital cataract which is formed earlier then it will leave behind the entire lens matter got uh, liquefied what is left only the capsule is left and that leaves a congenital membranous cataract it has a syndromic association but really this is not important only to complete the list so summarize doctor we have studied lamellar or zonular most common type of cataract and various types of polar cataracts etc etc now doctor how do you want to manage a case of congenital or a developmental cataract is my question to all of you so what are the indications for operating on a pediatric cataract it depends upon what kind of cataract it is will decide if it is a partial cataract or a small central cataract generally it is visually insignificant it can be ignored safely and observed and only thing what you need to do is a pupillary dilatation like a non surgical measure so that if centrally if the cataract is occupying the place then peripheral vision will help you to see the things so that's how you manage if it is a small central or a partial cataract suppose if bilateral dense cataract is there it should be removed early generally within about 6 weeks after the birth if you don't remove that visual deprivation will lead to development of amblyopia whether it is glaucoma whether it is cataract or uvi it is any problem if it is impairing the vision in a newborn baby it can lead to long term amblyopia which we don't want to happen but what is a favorite mcq of the examiner is you have a baby who has a unilateral dense cataract which is detected by the nurse who is treating the baby within few days after the birth so what do you want to do most of the times if it is unilateral congenital cataract the visual prognosis is very poor hence the moment you detect you operate it and get rid of it is the most important principle for a unilateral dense cataract is what you have to basically remember now doctor how will you get rid of this congenital cataract what are the surgical procedures available one option is you can do anterior capsulotomy and irrigation aspiration of the lens matter you can do lensectomy earlier days they used to even do needling operation but nowadays it is obsolete so what are the only left over procedures in case of congenital cataract this is a favorite mcq of the examiner anterior capsulotomy and irrigation aspiration of the lens matter other option is lensectomy there are the two options which are available now once you remove the lens the child will have fakia so how do you want to manage a pediatric fakia whose lens had been removed because of the underlying cataract which is visually disturbing if the child is above the age of 2 years you can be able to place a posterior chamber ivl during the surgery and if the child is below 2 years then you need to treat them by extended wear contact lens so what is the benchmark in pediatric uh, fakia management what number you need to remember 2 2 years about 2 below 2 is the difference in the management of the pediatric fakia 
which is one of the favorite MCQs of the examiner, which you need to be 100% sure, doctor. Then, in bilateral cases, you can offer spectacles. And later on, you can give a choice of secondary IOL implantation. Then, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, if you are planning for a intraocular lens in a pediatric patient, what are the important uh, commonly asked questions in the exam? The pediatric IOL you need to decide on the size, design and the power. Regarding the size, what is the principle? Once the child is about 2 years, you are placing an IOL after removing the cataract and the lens. The size of the IOL is between 12 to 12.7 millimeters in the diameter in the bag implantation. For the in the bag implantation is what need to be remembered. Which material you want to use? We use one piece polymethyl metacrylate and modified C-shaped haptics are the ones which are typically used in the design. Then what is the power of the IOL you want to use in the pediatric population? Typically in the children between 2 to 8 years, you need to use an IOL with 10% under correction, which is very important. Then similarly, in the children between 2 years, if you are using an IOL, you need to offer a under collection by 20% is recommended. So, these are the two common potential MCQs in the exam. Then always in pediatric cataract management, the most important vision threatening challenge for every ophthalmologist is the possibility of the development of amblyopia after cataract extraction. You must be very, very sure about. So, that is all the story. At least uh, 10 to 15 points you are now very sure about what questions can come on congenital and developmental cataract doctor. Now, senile cataract, which all of us see in the ophthalmology posting regularly, age related cataract. So, if I ask you a question, MCQ, commonest type of acquired cataract. What is your answer? Age related or a senile cataract is most common. It is equally common both in case of the men and women, usually above the age of 50. By the time people reach the 70th year, 90 percent will have senile cataract. And usually this condition is bilateral. Now, what are the various subtypes of the senile cataract? A senile cataract can be there in the cortex, cortical. Then you call it soft cataract. It can be in the nucleus, where you basically call it as hard cataract. Then within the cortical, you have two subtypes. It can start as a cuneiform, which is more common subtype, or it can be a cupuliform cataract among the cortical senile cataracts. This is the favorite MCQ of the examiner between cuneiform, cupuliform which is more common, cuneiform is more common. How will you remember cuneiform means Chinese letters, Chinese are more common. So, cuneiform is more common. Cuneiform is found in 70 percent of population, cuneiform type of a cortical senile cataract. Nuclear will be found in 25 percent and cupuliform will be found in 5 percent. Now, doctor, what predisposes to the development of senile cataract? Heredity definitely has a risk factor, ultraviolet radiation, dietary factors and dietary deficiencies, especially of the riboflavin, vitamin E and vitamin C. Any dehydration from cholera or diarrhea also can predispose to a dehydrational crisis leading to senile cataract and smoking is also a predisposing factor for the senile cataract. In few people, 
the age related cataract develops even before they are 50 then you call presenile cataract once more heredity diabetes have a association why people can develop presenile cataract especially if the diabetes is there nuclear type of a senile cataract is more common and tends to progress more rapidly because of the underlying uh, diabetes similarly myotonic dystrophy is another important risk factor for developing presenile cataract in myotonic dystrophy what type of cataract you have posterior subcapsular type of a presenile cataract is very common in myotonic dystrophy one of the favorite mcqs of the examiner similarly atopic dermatitis also predisposes to the development of the presenile cataract now doctor what is the mechanism why as the persons keep aging they develop a cataract if you look at the cortical senile cataract versus nuclear senile cataract the mechanisms leading to the development of them and the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms are different in cortical senile cataract there is a decrease in total protein amino acids and potassium and the increased concentration of the sodium and there is a marked hydration of the lens followed by coagulation of proteins is the underlying biochemical mechanism in cortical senile then as these are the colored halos which typically occur uh, um, because of the cataract we will come back to this whereas if you look at the nuclear type of a senile cataract it is not the hydration it is the dehydration which is the underlying pathophysiological mechanism and it is the degeneration which is the main theme of it and it leads to the hardening and hence it is also called hard cataract and there is increased amount of water insoluble proteins in case of the nuclear senile cataract and if you look at the total protein content and the sodium potassium distribution it is not altered in nuclear senile cataract unlike in the case of the soft cataract which is the cortical cataract in cortical cataract sodium potassium concentrations will change not in nuclear senile cataract then nuclear senile cataract also is associated with the deposition of the pigments which include urochrome and the melanin is what need to be remembered now we come to a very important area of our discussion which is uh, a dense forest of mcqs commonly which come from the topic of cataract come from this point stages of maturation of the senile cataract if you look at the cortical type of senile cataract first there is a, a stage called stage of lamellar separation so if i ask you a question what is the earliest to senile change in case of the cortical senile cataract what is your answer stage of lamellar separation it is the fluid which accumulated because we said no cortical cataract is because of hydration nuclear cataract is due to dehydration there is a separation of the lamellae by the fluid if you do slit lamp examination you can be able to demonstrate it and generally at the stage of the lamellar separation it is still reversible then you have stage of incipient cataract in this you discover early detectable opacities with the clear areas between them classically in incipient cataract now doctor if you look at uh, the senile cortical cataract in the incipient stage there are two types of distinct morphologies which you can recognize one is called cuneiform senile cortical cataract other is called the 
Cupuliform senile cortical cataract are the two distinct stages which you can differentiate uh, typically in the incipient stage. Four to five comments about each of them are very important. Cuneiform. Typically, it is more common than cupuliform. There are wedge shaped areas with clear, wedge shaped opacities with clear areas. They extend from the equator towards the center. And in the early stages, you need to dilate the pupil to demonstrate them. So, this is the typical appearance of what you call cuneiform senile cortical cataract. Now, one favorite MCQ of the examiner. What is the most common quadrant where you first see the changes of uh, the cuneiform senile cortical cataract? It is the lower nasal quadrant, is what you have to remember. Both the anterior and also posterior cortex, you find these uh, changes. And they typically progress towards the pupil. And if you do the oblique illumination, then they will be appreciated like radial spoke like pattern. They are the important issues. And if you use a ophthalmoscopy, direct ophthalmoscopy, then these opacities will appear like the dark lines against the retina's red fundal glow, is another important feature. And since this cuneiform cataract starts in the periphery and progresses towards the center, if you look at the visual disturbances, they are only noted at a very late stage. Whenever the central vision gets affected, visual deformity will be early. For most of the things, we use central vision. But since this affects periphery and progresses towards the center, towards the pupil. The visual disturbance is a late feature in case of the cuneiform type of a cortical senile cataract. Then how about cupuliform senile cortical cataract, doctor? Here you have a saucer shaped opacity just below the capsule and you, it usually involves the central part of the posterior cortex, it is generally a posterior subcapsular opacity, which one cupuliform. And gradually it extends outwards. And uh, since, see, you take the lens, you have an anterior capsule, posterior capsule. Posterior capsule may, central part is occupied by this. So the rays which are passing towards retina are blocked by this opacity which is located in the posterior subcapsular area and that is the reason the loss of visual acuity is a early feature in case of cupuliform senile cortical cataract but luckily this is rarer than it is found in 5% only 70% what you have is basically a cuneiform type of a cortical senile cataract is what need to be remembered. Then the next stage is called, uh, yes, Manu has rightly said, cataract is a dry topic in ophthalmology. Ophthalmology itself is dry. Okay, we can say driest in the dry area. But it is very easy to achieve. 10 out of 10 marks you can get in ophthalmology if you read once at least. I will tell you what are the 60 topics to read. Just read those 60 topics and go to the exam. 10 out of 10 you will get. In each topic there will be some 20, 25 common points to know. Totally a database not more than uh, 1000 to 1200 facts you need to know. If you know them clearly with a complete understanding, then no one can stop you from winning the exam. Hmm? Yes, uh, we have Dr. Purohiti also now online with us. After the after we finish the senile cataract, we will take up a quiz so that we will take up why we are reading. There must be a purpose for why we are reading such a driest of the dry 
subject no problem immature senile cataract is the next stage in this stage the lens become grayish white and the clear cortex is still present that is the reason if you throw the light you can still see the iris shadow the moment you can't see iris shadow it either achieved complete maturity or it is a normal one either of the two so the presence of the iris shadow means it is still immature senile cataract then you have intumescent cataract this is the next stage in this what happened the lens became swollen because of the continued hydration and since it got swollen it made the anterior chamber become shallow the intumescent cataract so this is how the typical intumescent cataract in a intumescent stage where it is being swollen typically looks like then you have a mature senile cataract what is the color of it the lens is pearly white and uh, it is called as a ripe cataract basically and the complete opacification is finished whole of the cortex is uh, involved in this stage then comes hypermature senile cataract hypermature can be of two forms one is called morgagnian hypermature and the second type is called sclerotic type of hypermature cataract let us talk about morgagnian hypermature in this the whole of the cortex which got opacified will start liquefying in the morgagnian and the lens is virtually converted into a bag of milky fluid it is still a bag because it has the capsule and that small brownish nucleus because the entire cortex got liquefied what happened to the nucleus it settles in the bottom and every time the person changes the position of head even the nucleus also is changing the position so this nucleus which is floating in a milky bag of the liquefied cortex you call it as morgagnian sometimes there can be calcium deposits into it so this is an example of that milky liquid like morgagnian cataract with the nucleus which is typically swimming inside it then you have sclerotic type of hypermature is the second type in this what happens the cortex become disintegrated the lens become shrunken why because there is a leakage of the water out of the lens the moment cortex got disintegrated and the anterior capsule become wrinkled and thickened because of the proliferation of the anterior cortical i mean capsular cells and it becomes very dense white capsular cataract which will form in the pupillary area in the sclerotic type of hypermature cataract and uh, in the intumescent stage what happened to the anterior chamber since lens was swollen anterior chamber became shallow and predisposed it towards development glaucoma in this people the anterior chamber becomes deep in sclerotic type of hypermature cataract because the lens got shrunken and the iris become tremulous iridodonosus is what you see in sclerotic type of a hypermature cataract then uh, these are the various stages which the cortical cataract will be progressing now let us look at how will be the maturation of a nuclear sclerotic cataract typically in this the nucleus become inelastic and hard and uh, it loses its ability to accommodate and it will be obstructing the light rays and in this the changes start in the center of the nucleus and it will be spreading towards the peri periphery and uh, uh, 
if there is a nuclear senile cataract, Though the entire nucleus became a hard nucleus, still some amount of the cortex, which is not yet affected, will be in a non-opacidified uh, state in case of the nuclear senile cataract. Ultimately, the nucleus becomes diffusely cloudy, grayish or tinted yellow because of the deposition of the pigments. So, depending upon the type of the pigment, a senile nuclear cataract is being called as cataract brumescence if it is of the brown or amber colored. Cataract nigra if there is a melanin deposition it became black or it is called cataract rubra if it is reddish. This is the favorite MCQ of the examiner. Cataract brumescence, where do you see? We typically see in case of a mature nuclear senile cataract because the deposition of the membranes is what you have to be very sure about. So that is all the story about the cataract and the maturation, different stages, subtypes, congenital cataract, etc, etc.